I'm here with my chook and poultry expert, Adrian Burgess, and we're gonna have a chat about backyard chooks. Now, I can't imagine life without my flock. What do you talk to people about when they're, they're looking to have chooks for the first time? Well, I, I suppose I talk more about what's involved with keeping chooks more so than their pretty one that they've seen at a show or seen in, in uh, magazines or whatever. So if you don't do your shedding, set up for your feeding um, and foxes or cats or dogs then it's pointless paying good money for birds that are special mm -hmm. or uh, what you like in terms of a breed and uh, through I suppose inadvertently losing your birds uh, within a short period of time or within 12 months so your investment's been wasted mm -hmm. and, uh, and so picking the breed is the last thing I usually talk about um, because you need the shedding yep. and, and shedding to me is important more for the owner than the bird because do you want little hutches which are fine but you have to get in there at some stage to do insect pests you have to get in there to get eggs you have to get in there to get your bird if one's sick in there and, and doesn't come out and so is that the best environment for you? So you want something with maybe head height so you can walk in there. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're lucky enough to have kids, kids love collecting eggs, so height is not so important. So shedding needs to be good, but in our environment, we need sheds that are um, got ventilation. Mm -hmm. And most of the bought ones don't have ventilation. There's no vent at the back letting the wind go through. And so you need that for our summers. Mm. Winter is not such a big problem for chooks, but uh, getting wet is. Mm -hmm. So, good ventilation, uh, good litter, and some way of controlling it for cleaning out. So maybe a base of some sort, uh, pavers, concrete, you know, whatever it might be. And Once, what, what do you, what litter would you suggest? I mean, we use a hay or straw. It, it depends on where you live, I suppose. What is in easy access? Uh, we're lucky enough now that if I, you know, we, there's, there's a multitude of things, but if you can't get hay, um, uh, or it's not convenient for hay, then um, uh, sugar cane mulch works well. Sandy, can we possibly just spin that round so people can see what's making the noise in the, in the background? I've also got my flock of geese in here, and they've decided to sort of photo bomb and video bomb, and they're being very noisy. <laughs> I don't know if that works or not. Anyway, so that's what all the sound is in the background of our conversation. So yeah. sugar cane mulch is quite good. Well, See, it, I'm not a fan of sugar cane mulch because it comes from Queensland, supports yep. Queensland farmers. So therefore, pea straw, yep. because you can get a small bale of pea straw and it will break up, you know, yeah. like even though it's tangly to start with, it'll break up. Um, but also, if you want to, uh, the fodder store will have bales of, uh, small bales of um, loosen hay. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the good thing about that is that whilst you can throw a biscuit of loosen hay in there as well, periodically, the birds will get the benefit of the loosen because they'll eat the leaves out of there, so it's green feed, so to speak, uh, and then it makes more litter. So, yeah. uh, but if you can't do all that, then shavings work, you know. Wood um, shavings. And wood shavings, not sawdust as such, but mm -hmm. wood shavings are super absorbent, and so any of the where they roost particularly, you'll have uh, uh, wet droppings, which then create fly, fly problems and smell and whatever. So having something that's absorbent means that it will eventually um, dry out. And, and, and then once a year, usually wait until the molt is over, which is sort of into winter, clean the shed out, uh, spray with whatever you deem effective mm -hmm. for what you want because a lot of the pests like stick fast, uh, skate leg and all that will be in the soil. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the better you can clean it, uh, even hosing out would be beneficial. Mm -hmm. Get that over and then you've got your chicken manure come litter for your garden at some stage during the year. So winter time, the reason I say winter is that once the birds are finished molting and you haven't got a shed full of feathers and you know all that sort of stuff. So. Pick the time you want to clean your shed out, otherwise you'll be forced to clean it 
twice a year or whatever. Yeah. So, um, and I've got a bit of a pumpkin obsession, and the reason I grow great pumpkins is all my chook manure that comes out. Yeah. You know, a couple of times a year, usually, we muck out the chook, duck, and goose yards, and that's how I grow beautiful pumpkins. Yep. Just throw it on the ground where I want to grow pumpkins later in the season, let it break down for a few months, and they're ready to go. Yeah, well, I, all of, well, I give a lot away, but uh, but I also dump mine out and my fruit tree area uh, where I live. The, I've got all of the manures I want. I've got cow manure down the road. I, it's really great. Our limiting access is water, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. and so my trees don't look all that brilliantly purely because I'm not giving them enough water. So, yeah. but yeah. the, the, the fertilising part is easy. It's taken care of. So shedding and bedding, we've got. Right. And one is perches. Mm -hmm. You need perches for birds, otherwise uh, dampness and other problems of them not roosting. They need to be timber, and they don't need to be round. Not like they're not like a bird where they've got a, a clutch. Chooks sit and rest on something. So 50 millimeter, 40 millimeter timber. Um, and support it in a way that uh, it's easily cleaned and easily sprayed or treated for uh, mites because mm -hmm. red mite will live in those perches. And the other one is nesting. Now I know you can buy special nests, you can use uh, washed out uh, plastic containers. Mm -hmm. Over the years I've tried everything and the reason I use sh half sheets of galvanised iron or uh, corrugated iron now is that they're easily taken out, sprayed down, washed down, or uh, treated with, in, in my case, oil uh, for pests that might be living on them or whatever. And the birds will go in, they just need that privacy. Mm -hmm. All my experience <laughs> with plastic containers is that you get a lot of insect pest build up in there. I don't know why, whether it's sheltered for them as well. Uh, and it didn't matter how much work I was doing with either back in, uh, time gone by insecticides or oil or whatever I found it was just too hard a work trying to keep the pests off the birds and so nests don't have to be special don't have to be bought mm. um, and the ones you buy that you put in the wall of your shed so you don't have to have access mean that chooks will lay in that nest box mm. but one maybe couldn't get in there when one was in there will lay in the corner of the shed. So eventually you end up going in the shed anyway. And I think it doesn't hurt to have that hands-on approach to see if there's a problem with the litter being caked down too hard or there's a sick chook in there you didn't see. And so I think having a sheet of iron in the shed where they go behind that and nest. And and how do you set that sheet of iron up, Adrian? Just, just on a, an angle. Oh, really? And they, okay. So I use, uh, what would they be? <laughs> Roughly a, a metre maybe lean it in and then it, it does become a bit of a problem sometimes i put a brick in front to keep the litter in there because mm -hmm. sometimes they will scratch in there if they haven't got enough activity if they're being let out into the garden that's never a problem because mm. they've always got something else to do uh, but it just means that if they start laying in a corner that you haven't chosen then you can shift a piece of iron over there and they will uh, gladly go in there so i think i've got two pens now that are uh, on their third corner okay yeah <laughs> sure it's a girl thing, but anyway, sure. they'll do it their they way. They can't make their mind up, you know what it's like. <laughs> so, uh, just simply, that you don't have to go into a lot of expenditure to do something pretty um, quick. Yep. Uh, and I'm pretty sure, even if you're in a suburban area, you'll find there's, there's uh, disposal places where you can get a bit of iron, or you'll know somebody somewhere who will have yep. a piece of iron that you can put up. Now, one thing we haven't talked about, and it's particularly relevant around here because we've had a fox take some of our flock that doesn't live in here, um, is making things fox proof. So our lockup yard, before we had the marimma, has wire that's buried into the ground and it goes out a metre. So if a fox tries to dig in and it's got an overhang. So, you know, keeping things fox proof, even in the suburbs, people think, oh, there's no foxes yeah. in Adelaide. Well, there's two things about that. A, you don't even really need a meter if you don't want to. Um, a sheet of iron buried, anything. Foxes will, will dig right by the fence. For some reason, on, they, they don't start out here and dig a tunnel. They start where they're near, closest to the birds. Uh, and they have been known to break some of that thin wire netting. Mm -hmm. um, but 
people also think that they don't climb. Well, they'll get over a six foot fence really easy, whether it be iron or, or mesh or whatever. So if you're going to have an outside yard, uh, say during the day where you let them out, then you need to have a top over it. Now, if they're running in a garden and you're home, that's not a problem. Sherlock. <laughs> He's worked that out again. <laughs> that's it. Sherlock, mate, come here. <laughs> so we've got everyone photo bombing here. Sherlock. You all want to be in it, don't you? <laughs> Uh, but fox proofing is very important. Speaking of fox proofing. <laughs> I have a big problem with them coming in during the day when our crops are up because they've got um, cover. Uh, but generally through summer I don't have as many problems with that. But certainly foxes are the big issue, uh, certainly in the city. The amount of people that have rung this year saying I've got to buy some more birds, foxes have got them. Mm. And they're living in suburbia yeah. and uh, there's probably more foxes in suburbia than they're out in the country areas now. So uh, they are, uh, you know, there are certain times where it might be a feral cat or it could be neighbourhood dogs get in and it's the fun of the chase. Those sort of issues are there. But if you've got reasonable security uh, and uh, if it's in a suburban where you don't let them out much or you only let them out because you're home, mm. then having a top on the yard. Uh, and with the threats of uh, avian flu, uh, it probably doesn't hurt to exclude native birds and, and certainly if you've got ducks and geese stopping wild uh, waterfowl coming into your water uh, which has been an issue in Victoria with uh, the wild ducks uh, so uh, really from a predator point of view that's about the worst unless you're talking about rodents and that getting into your shed and and certainly if you're in suburbia councils really like the idea of having a rodent nests uh, on property so uh, you need to be aware of places where rats and mice can can congregate or breed or whatever uh, and that can be handled pretty easily anyway so you've got your shedding organized and you're going to have chooks so then the thing is whether you have them free ranging which are they're an absolute delight but they do make a mess it's particularly in a, a small area if you don't have them free ranging and you just have a pen how big a pen do you need per chook is there a certain state there is um it really um, I suppose it starts with the number. Uh, for some reason, people think that they need, oh, I think I'll get half a dozen or I'll get 10 or something. But I look at it the other way. If, Sherlock. Sherlock. If you, Sherlock. If you uh, Sherlock. think about how many eggs you use a week, if, they, if your birds uh, lay an egg a day uh, and under the right circumstances, they'll certainly do that most breeds so if that's if that's a possibility then if you're getting we've, we've got four birds and we're getting four eggs a day we've got two dozen by the end of the week mm. do you use two dozen eggs yeah so it's not the number that sounds nice it's mm. what's practical yep. four birds we used to work on um, about a, if they're going to be locked up the whole time it's about a square meter per bird or thereabouts, depending on the size of the bird. Just the, like a little yard, so you don't yep. need that much space. No, that's why uh, in terms of talking about breeds, there are a number of bantam breeds and the old uh, bantam breeds, we've now got bantam breeds of a lot of the larger fowls that lay an egg as big as a chook. So on that basis, if you had uh, a, well, if we set a two point, well, 2.4 by 3 metre yard, which is a fair size. That's six square yeah. metres. So eventually you can have six birds like this in a pen. Yep. You could have at least 12 sure. of the larger bantam types that lay big eggs. 12 instead of okay. four or six of these. Yep. And so I, I recommend a lot of people, if they don't mind, there's plenty of pretty coloured ones. There. Mm. There's all sorts. Uh, I've got essentially a bantam Mediterranean breed that lays a white egg, but it lays an egg as good as a chook. Wow. So on that basis, you don't necessarily have to think about these fellas. Yep. Uh, uh, so you can pick and choose your breed. So your shed denotes roughly what you can do as well. Yep. Uh, but I, I think uh, environment is important if you, I, know, I do know they make a mess in the garden, but come summer, you 
you can protect your birds really well by letting them out and not doing anything else because they'll go in under a tree, bury down in the dirt, and it can be 45 degrees and they will still be happy. You keep them in a tin shed or some such hutch or whatever, then it's your job to make sure they're not getting too hot. And they will, particularly if they're in really good condition because the fat gets too hot and, and, and they'll succumb, you'll lose them. So I think having gardens and three or four birds disappearing in your garden uh, is not a big impost. And I, you know, I think people can do that. They can do it better than me. I've got too many in too many sheds yep. and therefore I have to provide the shade, the cooling, which can be water. I've got insulated ceilings. Mm. I've got shade cloth along the front, which I wet down. Uh, that's unnecessary for four or five birds in a backyard environment. Mm. So, so we've covered shedding numbers and, and we'll leave it open with regard to breeds because that's um, you know something people can decide for themselves. One of the things is what you feed them. So ours um, get all our kitchen scraps around here and they also get grain in the morning and a little bit of grain to go away at night. Have you got any thoughts on what's the best feed? Well I certainly like the, you know, if, if it's ease going to the fodder store buying a bag of feed. Yep. I certainly don't like pellets or crumbles in that sense. Uh, I'm not saying they're not nutritionally, they're, they're made to be nutritionally beneficial, but yep. I like the fact that the birds are not looking at, I call it grey mashed potato. Yeah, Three right. meals a day, every day. <laughs> if you get them one of the grain based mixes, yeah. there's yeah. sunflower seed, corn, lupin, uh, grains of various sorts. And so each bird has a choice mm. as to what they do. And they will pick and choose yeah. what they want out of that. The nutrition's in tiny little pellets in there. She's come off the nest. Yes, yes, she's gone back in. Um, <laughs> this is the quiet country life. Everyone says, oh, it must be so quiet. It's never quiet around here. <laughs> uh, so that's why I like that feeding. Kitchen scraps, I don't mind, except that um, there are a lot of things in kitchen scraps that chooks won't eat. Uh, so uh, citrus, uh, those sort of things, which mean they just sit around the yard, uh, fouling up the ground and encouraging rodents, rats, you know, whatever. So if you're going to do kitchen scraps, think about how many birds you've got. Sherlock. And if you Sherlock. look at those scraps Sherlock. from the point of view of a handful per bird, are you chucking out too much? Yeah. And I suspect in suburbia, most people would be throwing out too much per day, yep. uh, which means that it then gets fouled up and uh, yeah. the pen becomes greasy. And, and uh, uh, so, kitchen scraps fine. Yep. With some grain based yep. uh, to give them nutritionally a balanced diet, um, but be careful. Uh, I, as a as a choice, don't put anything to do with chicken, yeah. uh, chicken meats, uh, whatever, in our scrap bucket yep. because. I'm not saying that there's a problem, but I can eliminate a problem if there is one uh, coming through chicken meat. Yep. And I sort of, I like my birds, and so I'm not sure that they're real happy about eating another chook. No, <laughs> so, that's right. So, uh, it, but it's pretty simple. Yeah. Uh, and we've got really good nutrition in the form of a bag. Yep. Uh, put it in a bin away from rodents. Yep. And uh, if you want to buy automatic feeders or you just want a little bit, Certainly with geese and um, ducks, if you've got to lock them up, I prefer feeding it towards evening. Yep. That way they're going to come into the shed yep. and you lock them up. People talk about geese being out on the dam and they'll be safe. No, they won't. Perhaps you can get them on a dam. And, and they're very hard to get off the dam if they don't want to come in. And often with, in summer, beautiful night, they'll sit out on the water all night. And so foxes will definitely be active. Yeah. Bring them in with a feed. Yep. Because most of these things will do anything for a thief. Anyway. <laughs> Won't we all? <laughs> <laughs> and, and the other thing around here, you know, all our veggie um, waste, you know, comes in the orchard and uh, the chooks get a chance to pick it, you know, fresh greens and everyone knows they love silver beet, you know, and so they get lots of leafy greens if they want it or even the thistles or whatever I'm pulling out of the garden. See, in your case, the benefit is that you've got area yeah. and yeah. some of us are lucky enough for that. Yeah. But in suburbia, if you think about that uh, two litre ice cream bucket per day or whatever it might be, or even worse, uh, on that basis, it means that they, those four birds or six birds just 
physically can't get rid of can't it. Process it. Uh, they'll eat watermelon right down to the green rind, but then you've got these pieces of green rind yep. drying out in the garden. And if you've got a big area, not a problem. Yep. But in, in a small backyard, uh, smell yep. uh, and all those things that go with that. So it sounds like a compost and then just select what the fre uh, what uh, veggie scraps you're going to give yeah. your chooks is yeah. ideal. Now, we've covered a lot, but this is a topic that you could talk, you know, you could make a full length yes. um, mini series about. Yep. So, um, would you suggest people, if they're interested in poultry, that they go and join a local poultry club? Um, I don't, I, yes, they can. And we've got a number of poultry clubs, certainly closer to the city. Most of our breeders nowadays are not in the city because of roosters and whatever, so they're in the country. Uh, certainly going to a poultry club, uh, going to a show, you can either determine the breed you like and the owner, uh, a, a reputable owner, will tell you, nah, that's not really good because it's got feathery legs and it'll get wet in the grass and, and so it goes to bed uncomfortable and all that. So you'll get that information about what would be desirable for you, even though you have a liking um, for a particular breed because mm. it looks pretty or mm. whatever. Uh, but a poultry club really, uh, I suppose in a sense, it isn't dealing with um, your life with a few chooks in the backyard. Okay. What it's dealing with is uh, hopefully getting you so keen you want to start showing and uh, washing them and uh, presenting them for a judge. Yep. Uh, and not everyone's cut out to do that. So the poultry club, uh, there's certainly information available from poultry clubs in a mm. printed form, mm -hmm. South Australian Poultry Association. Um, uh, but also making contact with someone like yourself or me to, look, if you're interested in, say, a breed like this, we could recommend a couple of breeders who really know these birds backwards, been breeding them for 30 or 40 years, and uh, and we could have an argument with one of the owners I know of these. He's a passionate man about Sussex. I wouldn't, I don't talk people into Sussex. They look good. <laughs> They're poorer layers. They lay a small egg. They go broody at the drop of a hat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, oh, you're beautiful, darling. Don't you listen <laughs> to him? <laughs> but yeah. if you like them, yeah. that's part of it. I mean, yeah. um, and having uh, docile breeds, certainly yeah. where kids, I've got a granddaughter who's been doing it since she's a ripe old age of four. She's been doing it since about two. She carts them everywhere, on the swings, uh, you know, yeah. uh, on the bike, whatever. Um, and so you need something that's a little bit quiet, although she seems to be able to handle the wild ones. But um, so if you want the grandkids or your own mm. kids to be involved, a breed that's pretty cuddly, uh, <laughs> and uh, usually that turns out to be these, which we call uh, standard soft feather. Yep. Uh, and the Bantam soft feather. Yep. There are some game birds that are what we class as hard feather. Mm. They can be a little bit more active, mm. but a lot of the other birds, no. They and once again, if you've had them from a young age and you feed them by hand, yep. they'll come within catching distance, and yep. which makes it easy, easier if you, you, you if you if you get, let's say you're a bit arthritic and a bit senior in age then you don't want big birds you can't pick up and have a look at the legs and see if they've got scaly leg or they've got mites on them or whatever so you start to think about a smaller soft feather bird and these come in a bantam version yep. uh, that you can handle safely for yourself yep. and the bird yep. uh, and do treatments or whatever you need to do so uh, there's a multitude of them out there I mean, if you pick a wind up bantam, not a brilliant layer, but it's a soft bird like this. There's probably, uh, I'll be guessing now because people are always making new colours, but there's probably 16 colours in that breed alone in a bantam form. Yeah. So there's sure, certainly one out there that would suit somebody. Yeah. Um, and so that's the beauty of going to shows. Mm. I like that. The guy will say, mm, not real brilliant in a backyard. They'll be over yep. the fence and gone. Yep. Uh, so I think breed choice is is can be long and varied. Yep. But you want satisfaction. You want to be happy with them. Yep. The kids want to have something to play with. Yeah. Pick up eggs. Uh, and so the right choice 
is very important. Now there are some great books. So I think I've got several in on my bookshelf that I've read, and so I knew a little bit about the different breeds when we started. Um, and they're like Backyard Chooks, and I think Organic Gardening Magazine bred that. So get some of these books from the local library or invest in a copy. Now the one thing we haven't t touched on, and then we might call it, um, you know, uh, a wrap, was we didn't touch on water. Now we've. It's obviously important that just like dogs, <laughs> like my big fella here, that you have fresh water for your cook. Oh, Sherlock. Hey, come here. Come here. Um, fresh, fresh water or clean water, and certainly through summer, because yep. it can get hot. Yep. Um, we've got breeders who put blocks of ice in their water, I've and if you've only got a few, uh, that's not bad. Yeah. Um, the one thing that, um, if we deal with that, good clean water, yes. Mm. If you want to run geese and ducks, it means you either have to change your water very often or you have two water sources. The chooks and that will go to the duck pond to have water, but if they know they can go up a couple of steps to a water dish, geese make it a bit problematic because they're a bit taller, <laughs> uh, but with ducks, ducks don't normally walk up to water. They'll go to the pond that's closest to them and down the bottom. Uh, and ducks, geese not so bad, but uh, ducks particularly can turn clean water into mud in seconds flat. Yeah. Uh, geese, I'm, I'm always amazed with geese because every time I clean my goose ponds out, I'll have rocks, bits of metal. I know. Uh, they, <laughs> they, 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 they it's collect like bath stuff. Toys. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure what the the attraction is, but there's always <laughs> something in the water. In fact, they find nails and bits of wire, and you didn't think there was anything lying around, yeah, but yeah. it's in the water. Yeah. Um, so they're amazing. But you can run them together, all of those breeds together. You just need to think about the feeding part. Geese can be uh, domineering. Ducks can be but usually chooks will stand up to them and push them away. Yeah. Geese are a bit different but they will cohabit except if you're in a really confined space yeah. and then it becomes a problem. Yeah. Well Adrian that was absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing this information. I think um, what we'll have to look at doing in the future is running um, special poultry courses with you here now that you know the world's changed and we're, we're doing more events locally rather than uh, me traveling so much so thank you hope you enjoyed this great chat with adrian burgess and um, enjoy watching and enjoy your flock <laughs>